This is Chris Eccleston, bringing you a taste of what the devil might like for Christmas. Here's a story about writer's block. This is Thurlow's Christmas by John Kendrick Bangs. My dear courier, no man would believe me if I were to state to him the plain and indisputable fact that one night last month on my way up to bed, shortly after midnight, having been neither smoking nor drinking, I saw confronting me upon the stairs a figure in which I recognised my very self in every form and feature. I noticed in the face of this confronting figure every indication of all the bad qualities which I know myself to possess, and realised that that thing was, as far as I knew, entirely independent of my true self. To you alone have I hinted as to the troubles which have oppressed me, and to you they are confided only because of the demand you have made that I explain to you the extraordinary complication in which the Christmas story sent you last week has involved me. On Wednesday, you accused me of perpetrating a trifling and to you excessively embarrassing practical joke. And on Thursday, you reiterated the accusation, coupled with a demand for an explanation of my conduct satisfactory to yourself or my immediate resignation from the staff of the idler. To explain is difficult, for I am certain that you'll find the explanation too improbable for credence. But explain I must. In August, you inform me that you would expect me to provide a story for the Christmas issue of The Idler. I undertook the commission, and upon seven different occasions set about putting the narrative into shape. I found great difficulty, however, in doing so. For some reason or other, I could not concentrate my mind upon the work. One story, however, I did finish, but after it came back to me from my typewriter, I read it, and was filled with consternation to discover that it was nothing more nor less than a mass of jumbled sentences. It was then I went to you and told you, as you remember, that I was worn out and needed a month of absolute rest, which you granted. I left my work wholly and went into the wilderness, where I could be entirely free from everything suggesting labour, and where no summons back to town could reach me. I was able, at the end of my vacation, to come back to town greatly refreshed, and, as far as my feelings went, ready to undertake any amount of work. On the fourth day after my arrival, you came to me and said that the story must be finished at the very latest by October 15th, and I assured you that you should have it by that time. That night, I set about it. I mapped it out, incident by incident, and before starting up to bed had actually written some twelve or fifteen hundred words of the opening chapter. When I had gone thus far, I experienced a slight return of one of my nervous chills and, on consulting my watch, discovered that it was after midnight. I locked up the windows and doors, turned out the lights and proceeded upstairs to my room. It was then that I first came face to face with myself, that other self in which I recognised developed to the full every bit of my capacity for an evil life. Imagine the horror of it, and then ask yourself if it was likely that when next morning came I could by any possibility bring myself to my work table in fit condition to prepare for you anything at all worthy of publication in the idler. At the end of the week I felt better, and again I started in, and the story developed satisfactorily until it came again, and once more I was plunged into hopelessness. Thus matters went on until the 14th day of October, when I received your peremptory message that the story must be forthcoming the following day. 
at half past seven o'clock on the evening of October the 15th, I was sitting in my library trying to write when my front doorbell rang. On opening it, I saw standing before me a man of 50 odd years of age, tall, slender, pale faced and clad in sombre black. He was entirely unknown to me. Does Mr. Thurlow live here? I am Mr. Thurlow. Henry Thurlow, the author? Yes. Don't I look like an author? He laughed and candidly admitted that I was not the kind of looking man he had expected to find from reading my books. I ushered him into my library and inquired as to his business with me. He replied that he had been a reader of my writings for a number of years and that for some time past he had had a great desire to meet me and tell me how much he had enjoyed my stories. I have taken the keenest delight in reading your verses and humorous sketches. I may go further and say to you that you have helped me over many a hard place in my life by your work. I was quite won over to him by his simplicity as well as attracted to him by his kindly opinion of my own efforts and I did my best to entertain him. Showing him a few of my little literary treasures in the way of autographed letters, photographs and presentation copies of well-known books from the authors themselves. He observed quietly that I appeared to him to lead the ideal life and added that he supposed I knew very little unhappiness. Well, I can't say that I know little unhappiness. At the present moment, I am very much embarrassed through my absolute inability to fulfill a contract into which I've entered and which should have been filled this morning. I was due today with a Christmas story and I am utterly unable to write it. What kind of story is it to be? Oh, the usual ghostly tale, with a dash of the Christmas flavour thrown in here and there to make it suitable to the season. It may be that I have not come altogether inopportunely. Perhaps I can help you. For ten years I have secretly been at work myself on a story. It is a short one, but it has seemed good to me. It is a story which I have written and rewritten and rewritten time and time again in my leisure moments during the last ten years. It is not likely that I shall ever write another. I'm proud of having done it, but I should be prouder yet if it could in some way help you. I leave it with you, sir to print or to destroy. And if you print it, to see it in type will be enough for me. To see your name signed to it will be a matter of pride to me. Take it. It's yours. He pressed the manuscript into my hands and before I could reply had opened the door and disappeared into the darkness of the street. And then I read the story. When I began, it was with a half smile upon my lips and with a feeling that I was wasting my time. The smile soon faded, however. After reading the first paragraph, there was no question of wasted time. The story was a masterpiece. I read it once and was amazed. I read it a second time and was... tempted. It was mine. The writer himself had authorised me to treat it as if it were my own. Not only this, he had almost intimated that in putting my name to his work, I should be doing him a favour. Why not do so then? I asked myself, and immediately my better self rejected the idea as impossible. How could I put out as my own another man's work and retain my self-respect? I had just resolved on another and better course to send you the story in lieu of my own with a full statement of the circumstances when that demon rose up out of the floor at my side. This time more evil of aspect than before, more commanding in its manner. With a groan I shrank back into the cushions of my chair and by passing my hands over my eyes tried to obliterate forever the offending sight. But it was useless. The uncanny thing approached me and as truly as I write, sat upon the edge of my couch where for the first time it addressed me. Fool, it said. How can you hesitate? 
Here is your position. You've made a contract which must be filled. You are already behind and in a hopeless mental state. Even granting that between this and tomorrow morning you could put together the necessary number of words to fill the space allotted to you, what kind of thing do you think that story would make? It would be a mere raving like that other precious effort of August. On the other hand, if you don't have the story ready by tomorrow, your hold on the idler will be destroyed. There is the story in your hands. Think what it will do for you. It's one of the immortal stories. I shall not use it. You must. Consider your children. But it would be a crime. Not a bit of it. Whom do you rob? Think of it as it is. And act. Only act quickly. It is now midnight. The tempter rose up and walked to the other end of the room, whence, while he pretended to be looking over a few of my books and pictures, I was aware he was eyeing me closely, and gradually compelling me by sheer force of will to do a thing which I abhorred. And I... I struggled weakly against the temptation, but gradually, little by little, I yielded and finally succumbed altogether. Springing to my feet, I rushed to the table, seized my pen, and signed my name to the story. There! It's done! I've saved my position and made my reputation, and am now a thief, as well as a fool. If you send that manuscript to Courier, he'll know in a minute it isn't yours. He knows you haven't a secretary, and that handwriting isn't yours. Copy it. I did so. When it was finished, I went over it carefully and went out to the mailbox on the corner where I dropped it into the slot and returned home. When I returned to my library, my visitor was still there. Well? I wish you'd hurry and complete this affair. I'm tired and wish to go. You can't go too soon to please me, said I, gathering up the original manuscripts of the story. Probably not, but I can't go until that manuscript is destroyed. As long as it exists, there's evidence of your having appropriated the work of another, why can't you see that? Burn it. I thrust the pages one by one into the blazing log fire and watched them as they flared and flamed and grew to ashes. As the last page disappeared in the embers, the demon vanished. I was alone, and throwing myself down for a moment's reflection upon my couch, was soon lost in sleep. It was noon when I again opened my eyes and ten minutes after I awakened, your telegraphic summons reached me. Come down at once, was what you said, and I went. You handed me the envelope containing the story. Did you send that, was your question. I did, last night, or rather early this morning. I mailed it about three o'clock. I demand an explanation of your conduct. Of what? Look at your so-called story and see. If this is a practical joke, Thurlow, it's a damned poor one. I opened the envelope and took from it the sheets I had sent you, twenty-four of them. They were every one of them as blank as when they left the paper mill. I turned and rushed madly from the office, leaving the mystery unexplained. You know that you wrote demanding a satisfactory explanation of the situation or my resignation from your staff. This courier is my explanation. It is all I have. It is absolute truth. I beg you to believe it. For if you don't, then is my condition a hopeless one. Be sympathetic, courier. Or, if you cannot, be lenient with me this time. Believe. 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 I implore you. Signed, Henry Thurlow. The following is a note from George C. Courier. Dear Henry, your explanation has come to hand. As an explanation, it isn't worth the paper it is written on. But we are all agreed here that it is probably the best bit of fiction you ever wrote. It is accepted for the Christmas issue. Enclosed, please find cheque for £100. Yours ever, G. Courier. The Devil's Christmas is produced for Radio 2 by Frank Sterling at Unique. The music is by Chris O'Shaughnessy. This is Chris Eccleston wishing you a very good night.